Okay, um, I'm going to give the next talk. It's just going to be a broad overview of radio surgery. Uh, V's only given me 15 minutes, so it's going to be pretty, pretty basic. Um, I'm happy to talk during the breaks with anybody that wants to know a little bit more detail. When you're talking about um, stereotactic radio surgery, um, the, the big name that always comes to mind historically is a gentleman named Lars Lexell. He was a neurosurgeon in Stockholm. And um, he, you know, really is considered the father of stereotactic um, radio surgery. He started using radio surgery to, to treat uh, patients in the 1960s um, and uh, developed the initial gamma knife at that time. And uh, he, you know, survived well into the um, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and he actually trained a lot of the um, big names in stereotactic radio surgery here in the United States. So, um, you know, if you go to the top programs, um, John Adler, who developed the CyberKnife, was a pupil of Lars Lexell. Uh, Dade Lunsford, who runs the Gamma Knife at Pittsburgh, probably the biggest Gamma Knife Center in the country, he, he trained with Lars Lexell. So uh, many of the, the, the current leaders in stereotactic radio surgery um, were trained by this gentleman. So the concept of, of using focused radiation actually goes back all the way to 1951. And I, I present this data because often I get asked by patients to say, hey, uh, you know, I heard radio surgery is relatively new. You know, I, it's a new treatment you're telling me about. You know, wh why should I have that treatment? And, you know, it's really not new. We're coming up to almost 70 years of, of this concept of, of radio surgery. Originally, radio surgery was not done to treat tumors back in the 1950s. It was done to um, uh, treat patients with, with functional disorders like Parkinson's disease and tremors. Uh, and they, uh, the surgeons at that time uh, knew that if they lesioned the brain in certain areas, created a lesion with the radiation, they could make movement, movement disorders better. Um, so it wasn't until kind of the 60s that the radio surgery was shifted to treat uh, tumors. Um, so what radio surgery is, it's treating a tumor with a focused beam of radiation. Uh, it uses a high number of cross-fired beams. So beams come in from many different angles from these machines and they all are, are highly accurate and they, they treat the tumor. Uh, there are several different types of machines that can treat uh, these uh, tumors. So um, here we have a linear accelerator uh, up, up at the top and it uses uh, X-ray photons. Um, there's uh, heavy particle machines that use protons. Some of you have heard about that. And then of course the gamma knife uses radioactive cobalt. Um, the, the machine we use here at Stanford is the CyberKnife, which is a, a machine that consists of a robot with a lightweight linear accelerator. The patient lies on the table. There are image detectors on the floor and imaging sources in the ceiling that track the, the patient's motion. So the CyberKnife has gone through um, several different generations. This is the current generation of the CyberKnife. It's called the M6 uh, CyberKnife, and this is what it looks like. And um, for some reason, they did a bunch of studies that show that like light green light is more soothing to the patient than any other color, so that's why they put that in the system. So again, this is a little cartoon. It shows the machine tracking the patient position and then laser, almost like laser beams of radiation to, to um, treat the tumor. So radiation is always invisible, but when we show it in these cartoons, oftentimes we make it look like a color, so patients sometimes think it's like a, a, a laser pointer beam, but essentially it's invisible beams of radiation. So the, the advantages of radio surgery, it's an outpatient, non-invasive procedure. Um, there's no recovery period, uh, and there's none of the surgical risks of, of radiation. Uh, one of my patients actually was um, one of the uh, Stanford gardeners who planted um, the flowers that you see around the campus. And uh, on the day of her, her radio surgery treatment, um, she went to work, she was planting flowers. Um, we, when it came time for her appointment, we called her up. She basically left her flower pots on the sidewalk, came over, got her treatment for her acoustic neuroma, and then an hour later was back planting the flowers on the sidewalk. So, you know, it's a, that, that's the primary advantage, it's just outpatient and non-invasive. The, the disadvantages of radio surgery are that it takes a couple years for us to really be able to say, yeah, the, the tumor is controlled and responding to treatment, because these are slow-growing tumors. So if you get an MRI scan six months after your radiation treatment, you can't say that you've had a successful treatment because the natural history of the tumor is it might not have changed 
in that six months. But if you follow a tumor over time, many of these um, you know, over decades will grow. So if you have um, no growth on subsequent MRI scans, and then we say that the treatment has been successful. Um, the tumor, during the actual dying process of the tumor, there can be inflammation. So I like to tell patients the tumor releases these inflammatory factors as it dies, and those can irritate the surrounding nerves. So in someone that comes in with uh, vertigo or balance problems or tinnitus or hearing loss, those symptoms may actually fluctuate during the dying process of the tumor. And it's common for a patient to say, hey, my, my tinnitus is flared up, you know, a year after radiation treatment. And again, that's part of the fluctuation. So we always remind patients prior to treatment that this is something that can happen. We see it in about a third of patients. And, uh, you know, generally, we just reassure the patients and say, yes, we, we, we understand this, we know it's happening, generally settles down. If it's really severe fluctuations, that's when we sometimes may use steroids to, uh, to reduce the inflammation. Uh, and then a couple other issues. With, with radio surgery, you don't get any pathology. Um, that's generally not a problem because we, we know with uh, these vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas, they're located you know, in a specific location in the cerebellopontine angle. So we have a high degree of certainty that we know what, what we're treating, but we, we don't get pathology. And on rare occasion for some patients, that's a big deal. They want some peace of mind. They're not happy with the concept that we're 98, 99% sure this is an acoustic neuroma. They, they just want that pathology, and that can only be done with, with surgery. And then finally, um, with radio surgery, it's, it's good for small to medium tumors that are either non, not symptomatic or, or minimally symptomatic. If you have a large acoustic neuroma and you're falling over because of balance problems and it's pushing on the brain, the radio surgery is really not an option for you. You need to get the brain decompressed uh, with, with surgery. So the, um, the steps um, for radio surgery treatment are, are pretty basic. You come in for clinic visits with the uh, neurosurgeon or the ENT surgeon and the radiation oncologist. Uh, we determine whether you're um, suitable for treatment. Uh, the next step is what's called simulation or preparation where a patient comes in and we do some very specific imaging of the head to plan the targeting of the radiation. So this is done a day or two before the treatment, and that gives us 24 to 48 hours for the surgeon and the radiation oncologist and the medical physicist to work together to plan the uh, radiation to your tumor. Then there's the actual treatment, and then the follow-up imaging and clinic visits. So like surgery, there's been a long history of, of radiation for acoustic neuromas. I want to talk a little bit about the history. So this data comes out of, of University of Pittsburgh. Um, and at the very beginning of their radio surgery program in 1987, they were um, treating acoustic neuromas with higher doses than we use today. So you can see they were using doses of 16 to 20 gray because that's what they knew was used for other tumors like cancer of the brain and whatnot. So they started with that dose. And what they noticed is that they, they were getting really good tumor control, but not so good you know, issues with side effects. So, you know, a fifth of the patients were having facial nerve issues with the radiation, and a quarter of the patients were having trigeminal nerve. This is the nerve that controls a feeling of the face. It's the cranial nerve number five. So about a fourth of them were having problems with that. So, you know, they, they looked at this data um, around the early 1990s, and they, they said, well, we're getting really good tumor control. Is there any way we can reduce the side effects? So they started lowering the dose of radiation. So the dose they went to was about 12 and a half to 13 gray. And you can see there's no change in tumor control, still 98%, but look at what happened. The side effect rates just dropped completely. So um, this was the, the genesis of the current doses that are used uh, these days. Now, you can't just add up the numbers if you go to a center that delivers multiple treatments. So for example, here at Stanford, we will treat a patient with radiation that has good hearing with 18 gray. Gray is the units of radiation. And the patient says, well, you're giving me 18 gray. That's going to be way up here. You know, that's, that's not the case because if you deliver 18 gray over three days, that's six gray a day, six plus six plus six equals 18. Giving it over three days is the equivalent of roughly 12 gray in a single dose. Your body is able to compensate for that radiation. So 18 gray in three sessions equals 12 gray in a single session, which is actually the, the data that single fraction gamma knife centers are using. So, so, so I get some patients that just say, I'm gonna add up the numbers and it doesn't make sense and then this is the reason why. 
So um, in terms of what the literature shows in terms of, of toxicity and side effects if you use the radiation, um, this was a, a paper that, that uh, a uh, meta-analysis done just about five years ago. And in this particular paper, they looked at hearing preservation, facial nerve function, and trigeminal nerve function. And they basically divided the, the patients into high dose and low dose. And you can pretty much see that um, with low doses of radiation, you get very good numbers in terms of no side effects. Um, and as you go up to higher doses, you get side effects. And these are statistically significant. So uh, a little bit about the, the Stanford experience. So um, we started doing radio surgery here in, in 1989, and that was actually the same year I started uh, medical school here. Um, and it was a frame-based linear accelerator radio surgery. We did that for about 10 years. Um, during the 1990s, um, you know, the CyberKnife was developed here at Stanford, so we were doing a lot of beta testing with the FDA. Uh, but it was approved for treatment anywhere in the brain by the FDA in 1999. So since then, over the last 20 years, that's been our preferred method of, of treating patients. And again, for patients with hearing, we use three session treatments over three consecutive days, like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. If you come in and have no hearing on that side, we just do a single shot of radiation because the, the three fraction session is, is done for hearing preservation. Um, we tend to, to treat tumors that are larger than some other centers. So um, a patient that will come to see us uh, for a second opinion with a, a you know, tumor that was considered too large for radiation at another center um, is something that, that we often will treat here. And, and I, I think that's in large part because of our experience uh, with these. We've, we've treated even tumors above three centimeters uh, with radiation. So a little graph that shows the trends over time here at Stanford. So back in uh, 1999 to 2003, you can see 75% of acoustic neuroma patients here at Stanford were treated with surgery and only 15% with radiation. And then about 10% were in the middle that had uh, surgery plus radiation. And then, and then you can see now over these, these intervals how uh, the use of radiation, in this case CyberNAF, has increased in percentage. So, uh, you know, the last uh, grouping of data from 2014 to 2018, 68 percent of patients that had acoustic neuromas here at Stanford got radio surgery. Only 25 percent got surgery, and then about 5 percent got both. So this is the, the trend of, of becoming non-invasive. This is a little cartoon that kind of shows how the radiation works. We contour the tumor that's that red line there, and then we, we bring the radiation in. Each of these blue lines is a series of radiation beams. Uh, and patients often ask me, well, you, what are the beams doing to my normal tissue as they go in? You know, if we simplistically break this down to 100 different beams of radiation that come in from many different angles, each beam carries, let's say, 1% of the radiation. That's not sufficient to damage any tissue. It goes through your head and out the other side, and tissue's not damaged. But all the beams coalesce and sum at the tumor. So the tumor gets a cumulative dose of, beam, of radiation from 100 beams, but the normal tissue is, is spared, and that's how we can get tight radiation to uh, the tumor these days. Um, this is uh, data from, from Stanford in terms of tumor control. Um, and you can see that over um, three years, very good control over five years, very good control. And this is over 383 patients. Um, when we looked at, at uh, larger tumors, we see there's a, there's a difference. So um, when we look at um, tumors that are smaller than three cubic centimeters, we have good control. The larger tumors, we have less good control. So one of the questions comes up, if the patient comes in with a small tumor and asks if they want, you know, if I watch this tumor, what's the, the, the risk? Uh, the risk is that if the tumor does grow over time and you have a larger tumor, you may end up with lower control rates if you choose radiation at that time. And at some point, the tumor may, may become too large and then you'll need to have surgery. In terms of uh, our data, this is the, the non-auditory complications. We only had, um, we had no patients with facial paresis in this series. Um, we had a couple patients that had twitching of the face. This is actually the, the facial nerve being overactive. It's irritated, so your face twitches. Um, we had a couple of patients that had kind of some numbness in the face or tingling in the face. Uh, and hydrocephalus is a buildup of fluid in the brain. That can happen whether you watch the tumor, whether you have surgery, or whether you have radiation. It's actually highest if you have surgery, um, but um, it's thought that the protein or blood products gum up the normal pathways of the fluid absorption, and that can cause uh, problems. 
Uh, we, we know that the larger tumors have higher um, side effects with uh, radiation, so this, uh, again, breaks down the tumors into smaller and larger. We use, arbitrarily use 3.4 centimeters as a cutoff, and you can see the, the difference in uh, cranial nerve complication rates. So a lot of people have looked at their, their data for radiosurgery, and this slide shows a number of series, number of patients. See, everybody's kind of huddled in the same dose here. Um, and again, 18 doses and three equals about 12. So we're in this ballpark there. You can see tumor control, mid-90s, varies again on the size of the tumor. Small tumors have much higher control rates than larger tumors. And again, you can see the side effect rates are, are, are relatively low. And these are all like what I call modern day uh, data. So um, Dr. Jackler mentioned kind of um, combined approaches for this. Uh, and this is a patient that had a large tumor there. Um, and this patient um, just really didn't want any facial nerve injury. And I think they were a public speaker. Um, so they're, they're, they said, if you know, my facial nerve is injured, that's, that's it for my job. And uh, so we did a subtotal resection um, and uh, left a little bit of tumor along the facial nerve there and then treated that residual with, with CyberKnife. And you can see years later, there's just a dead scar, scar there. So this was a combined, I call this a multimodality approach of, of, of surgery followed by radiation. Just a couple more slides that I want to talk about. Um, one is this concept of transient enlargement after radiosurgery. So we talked about how the tumor can swell um, during the dying process and release inflammatory factors. Um, that swelling can manifest both as clinical symptoms, I mean, my tinnitus is flaring up, but we can sometimes often see it on the MRI scan. So this is a patient that underwent radiosurgery in 1999, and two years later it looks like the tumor's bigger. And that can cause a lot of panic. The patient thinks that radiation treatment didn't work. Um, but we know that this is a, is a transient phenomenon. If you keep following the patient, two years later, the tumor is shrunk back down. So back in the early days of radiosurgery, a number of these patients that had tumor swelling got operated on. And uh, you know, it was kind of almost unnecessary surgery. The Mayo Clinic has looked at this, the, this data, and they, they've shown that over 95% of patients that have tumor enlargement after radiation in the first couple of years, over 95%, it's just it's tumor swelling, not tumor growth. So we just try to reassure patients and kind of monitor them. Uh, so to summarize, um, uh, you know, radiosurgery has been around for decades. It's not a, not a new treatment. The dosing and fractionated regimen has evolved over time to the current modern regimen. It's non-invasive compared to surgery, but takes several years to document its effectiveness. So if you, you know, you ha it's something you have to be very patient with and kind of monitor, and the overall tumor control rate is excellent. Uh, thank you for your time. Okay, A any questions? Yes. So the question is, um, uh, the, uh, what's the thought process of a gamma knife for a 14-year-old that has an acoustic neuroma, and what are the, the longitudinal long-term side effects of, of the treatment? So the couple things. First, a 14-year-old with an acoustic neuroma um, raises the issue of neurofibromatosis, potentially, um, because they are developing it at a, at a young age. Um, and in, and it, it may be that they have neurofibromatosis. This, just, this is the first manifestation of it. Um, so if, if there is neurofibromatosis, then the radiosurgery rates are not quite as high. Um, the tumor behaves differently. Um, so it, it would be something that, you know, I would encourage testing just to make sure they don't have neurofibromatosis. Um, and then something that would entail, if you do have the treatment entail, uh, close follow-up and monitoring. Um, we've done a number of patients, a young, you know, young patients that, that age. Um, and, uh, you know, is... As long as it's not a neurofibromatosis scenario, the, the, the data is similar to, the, to what I've shown. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, tumor control over time, I think most of the studies you showed, and indeed most of the studies I've seen referenced elsewhere, only go up to 10 years. Is that basically because the technology, we haven't been doing it that long, and if so, can we expect studies to come out in the near future about uh, beyond 10 years, or, or is there existing data on that point? 
Yeah, that, that's a good question. So the, the question is, is what happens long-term with follow up with this? Um, so many of the patients, um, you know, when they get further out from their radio surgery treatment, we follow them less frequently. So, you know, I have some patients here, um, you know, one of the speakers, patient uh, speakers uh, 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 this noon is Mark McLaren, who runs our Stanford in a support group. He's a patient. I think he's, how far are you out, Mark? 18, 18 years out from radio surgery treatment. So um, the, the difficulty is patients oftentimes are only, at that point, are only getting monitored every five years. Um, I, some of them just choose not to follow up, particularly, the, you know, if you're treating a 70-year-old with acoustic neuroma with radiation, you know, I, 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 sometimes I get these letters, uh, you know, Dr. Chang, you treated me when I was 72, I'm now 87, it's been 15 years, I'm just not coming in anymore, I feel great. <laughs> and um, what, the, the, the problem is, um, okay, you know, he lives like four hours away, doesn't want to drive, you know, you know, the issue of the gadolinium, if you need to give that. Um, so uh, the, the, the difficulty is the patients that are that far out are actually very key patients in terms of the data. So we, we try to chase them around, you know, um, you know Mark is very important for our data set, so I don't want to lose him. But um, you're correct, is that many of the, the publications don't go out past 10 years. Many of the surgical publications don't go out past 10 years either. So some of it is just getting, getting patients to actually show up for their, their follow-up. So if you do have radiation and you're that far out, um, please don't, don't write the letters saying you're not coming in yet. I actually show up for these treatments here, key data. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.